Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics, welcome to the 33rd annual Jonathan J. King Lectureship. I'm Dr. Carrie Brenner. I'm a palliative care physician here at Stanford, and I also have the honor of serving as chair of the Jonathan J. King Lectureship Committee. It's an honor to have you here in person. I know more will be shuffling in. And we also simultaneously have a live stream right now where there are hundreds of people viewing from truly across the globe. So thank you all for joining. Before I introduce our speaker, Dr. Harvey Chachanoff, I'd like to share with you for the first time a new video we created featuring archive footage of Jonathan King himself. His vision of integrating the humanities and the patient as a person within medicine inspired the founding of this lectureship over 30 years ago. This video provides a glimpse into the history, the mission, and the spirit of Jonathan King. I have uh, a wife whom I love very much. I have two boys who are about to turn six and twelve. I spent a lot of time with them. I'm working on my projects as much as I can. And, and this I consider to be a very important activity also. Jonathan was um, inherently such a likable person. He was kind. He was honest. He was authentic. He was genuine. And he was just a lot of fun and also very smart. He was not satisfied with simple questions. He wanted to understand the bigger context in which those questions were framed. There's a line that divides people who have passed over into the condition I'm in from everybody else. In a way, there's no way that I can convey to you this feeling of, of the death sentence. There are some things that I learned throughout this experience about what's important to me as a patient. What are some of these important insights that have come to you? I'm glad you asked because I wrote some of them down. Good. <laughs> I think the main one is, is just common sense. And that is to empathize. To put yourself in the shoes of your patient as much as possible. And I know that that counters, flies in the face a little bit of the uh, training of professional detachment. And believe me, I appreciate how important it is for uh, a doctor, especially an oncologist, who has to deal with patients like me, who they feel, with all their scientific training, is going to die, that it won't be very pleasant. I completely agree with what Jonathan said. He's 100% on target. Physicians who are great are empathetic. So many things flow from that. If you respect your patient, you will listen. If you respect your patient, you will have empathy. But I think the second point I'd like to emphasize is how important it is for the doctors, the medical staff, to foster a patient's feeling of control and of hope to whatever extent you can, even if, they're, even if that's very, very small. He was very thoughtful about that and, and how differently you are treated once you are a cancer patient with no hair. The kind of impersonal, even though you're with doctors that are caring and all that, you know, you're, you're on a gurney in a hallway and some radiology tech comes and takes you in to get you your films and you feel like you're just this sick guy to that person and all, everything that made you who you were was totally unrecognized by the medical staff. When first the surgeon and then the oncologist told me after the results of the post-operative 
tests came back that yes, the mass we saw was the same type of cancer, and this is really what's going to happen. I needed to know that right away. He had a variety of reactions, as I remember. One was disbelief. One was panic. Uh, one was um, depression. But overriding all of those was a determination. He was determined that somehow he was going to try to beat the odds. He wanted to be the one in a million patient who somehow would survive. Now, how could you try to give somebody in my situation mm -hmm. a feeling of control and of hope in the face of all of this? Mm -hmm. What do you do? That's the art that you're trying to learn, I think. As I said in my eulogy, I called him a humanist that wanted to make a difference for uh, the people of the world. I was reading a online memorial tribute to Dr. King that said he was a humanist in a technical world. It was really interesting because it actually made me think so much of Paul. And maybe so much about what the ideal doctor is to be someone who's a humanist in a technical world. And I loved that phrase. A central point is treating the patient as a client. One aspect of that, which I found very important, is keeping the medical records open and available to the patient. And I would say do that for everybody, except those who plead with you. I don't want to know. And even then, that's the art of, of empathizing, of getting it to your patients and understanding as far as possible what they need. In a case like mine, where uh, the odds are just appalling at the start, I think you can expect an alter alternation between periods of frantic searching and, and alternating with a commitment to some plan. There were times when, of course, he was very, very down. Um, and it was very hard for him to, to continue with the battle, um, but he did, he did. And he maintained his normal family life uh, as best he could under the circumstances. Jonathan was many things. He was a scholar, scientist, social critic, jazz buff. He was devoted to his family. He was an honest commentator on life. He was too much a curmudgeon to be a naive optimist. Yet, he was too gentle and kind to be a pessimist. Another point I'd like to make is to make, is do whatever you can as part of a, of a medical staff to make the physical and institutional surroundings as pleasant as possible. If you respect your patient, you will want to have uh, the surroundings in the hospital and medical centers and doctor's offices um, reflect that. Another point I'd like to urge on everybody is to help the patient build a support system and to reinforce his own status wherever it's possible to do that. So as a doctor, I would say, if possible, help the patient to find someone who will come with them. And not just for support, you know, hold your hand or pass the time, but also you could talk it over. What did they mean by that? You shouldn't fear or disparage any effort that the patient makes to try to build that support for himself. Don't feel threatened at all. If your patients are seeking help, even from other doctors, if they want to get up and leave, they'll tell you. Could you say a little more about um, the changing locus of hope as the disease um, progressed? The major change in hope is uh, 
for B was pretty recent. My hopes are still of living, uh, living well in the days that I have, keeping as much strength as I have. Early will tell you that I came to talk to him just two weeks ago, and my voice was a great deal stronger oh, yeah. than it was then. I'm surprised mm -hmm. at how fast uh, I have weakened in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so I'm glad we're doing this today. I would like to see a lecture uh, every year that whose basic point is just to remind people of some of the things that I've been talking about today. When it comes to um, the lectureship, certainly, and the origins of the lectureship, it's all recorded in his journal. It reflects the enthusiasm he had, the vision that he had for it, and the determination he had to see this thing get started, and he really felt that it would have an important, lasting effect. He was very sick by the time he did that session with Ernley. It's incredible how long he went when you think about how sick he was at that time. And he desperately wanted to attend the first lecture. We had set it up and had the first speaker planned while he was still alive. Rita Sharon presented the first Jonathan King lectureship in uh, 1991. That's wonderful because a, a variety of remarkable people have given the lectures. I think the King lectureship um, and Dr. Jonathan King's words are so relevant and important and um, yeah, just really relevant now, even 30 years later. I think that's one reason that the uh, the lecture series appealed to him so much. He could turn a terrible situation for himself into something that could possibly make a difference for other people. I think one of the roles of this lecture, and maybe the primary one, is what Dr. King was talking about, where he says, you know, try to get into my shoes and try to think about this experience um, for me as a person and build care around that. And in the way you talk to me, think about that. And it's such a simple message, like to think, don't forget that your patient is a person. But I think in all of the science and all of the busyness and all of the suffering, it can be weirdly easy to neglect that. And so, I just think this lecture is such a beautiful way to re-elevate and reconnect um, with what's most important. So I'm certainly not alone in all this. All of you must be aware just your being here means that you're part of a movement which is trying to make this happen. But I'd also like to be there, make a, a three-minute introduction, and through the magic of editing, we could say, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jonathan King. Welcome to the 20th annual lecture. personally thank Alan King. Can you raise your hand, Alan? Jonathan's wife, who devoted tireless hours um, for us to really curate all of those archives to recreate that video. Thank you, Alan. So echoing Jonathan's words, welcome, not to the 20th, but now to the 33rd annual lectureship. And tonight's speaker, we're very honored to have Dr. Harvey Chachanoff, who truly radiates and embodies the messages that Jonathan wished to impart in this lectureship, specifically empathy and the essence of the patient as a person. Dr. Chachanoff is a distinguished professor of psychiatry at the University of Manitoba in Canada, as well as a senior scientist at Cancer Care Manitoba Research Institute. He is one of the world's most influential proponents 
of improved and expanded palliative care. Through his pioneering work, he has significantly advanced both the recognition and the treatment of distress, depression, and demoralization for patients who suffer with life-limiting illness. For over three decades, Dr. Chachanoff has published over 300 manuscripts on existential suffering, empathic communication, intensive caring, a vast array of topics. He is internationally acclaimed for being the founder of Dignity Therapy, which is the most studied psychotherapeutic intervention in palliative care today. Dignity Therapy has been adopted and implemented truly across the globe, Taiwan, China, Japan, Japan, all throughout Europe. Its salutary effects show that it enhances patients' quality of life as they face serious illness. Dr. Chachanoff has been appointed as an officer in the Order of Canada and an inductee of the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. He holds the only Canada research chair in palliative care. His accolades overflow. And yet what is most luminous about Dr. Chachanoff is his authenticity, his wisdom, his thoughtfulness, his humor, and his edifying presence. And it's been such an honor to get to know you personally over the past couple of days. So we are honored here tonight to have Dr. Chachanoff speak about reflections on dignity in palliative care, the human side of medicine. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm uh, deeply honored. I'm, I'm so moved by uh, Dr. King's uh, story, and I'm so moved by uh, Dr. King's legacy and being chosen to be a part of this um, incredible uh, lectureship. Um, in the course of my career, and I think we should get the first slides up. There we go. Here we are. In, in the course of my career, I've... Uh, had many opportunities, and uh, this certainly will stand out as, as one of the highlights. In fact, when I was approached to, to do this lectureship um, and asked to come down to do the King Lectureship at Stanford, um, it took a few seconds, and that's just because I was moving perhaps slow to say, well, yes, I, I will come and, and do that lecture for you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I hope that the, the remarks that I uh, share with you are in keeping with the, uh, the spirit of the King Lectureship. And uh, again, as I say, it's a, a deep honor. Um, I've, and, you know, I've been at this for uh, many years, so now um, over, over three decades. And uh, there's just been so many opportunities along the way. Uh, uh, just this past year, for instance, I was the Cicely Saunders International uh, Lecturer um, at King's College. And then after that, I uh, was whisked off to, uh, to Oxford University, where I gave uh, grand rounds uh, there. And I just want to point out that the reaction from the people in the UK <laughs> was extraordinary. And, um, and kind of raised the threshold on you know, my expectation on what an appreciative audience looks like <laughs> and, and, and sounds like, just, just so that you know. So um, Dame Cicely Saunders was the founder of the, uh, the modern hospice movement. She founded uh, um, uh, um, St. Christopher's Hospice. And um, I was fortunate enough as a, a young man to be invited there after I had started contributing to the literature and uh, deliver a, a lecture. Um, Dame Saunders had the reputation of uh, not suffering fools gladly, which means that I was anticipating that when we would first meet, she would um, take me to task perhaps on articles that either she didn't understand or felt that need to be clarified further. And as I was anticipating this visit, I increasingly became anxious about the, the one eviscerating question that Dame Saunders would greet me with when I eventually would walk into her study. And uh, uh, for those of you, if you haven't been to St. Christopher's Hospice, it's a, it's a very interesting experience. Uh, I remember walking in and being told to you know, sit down until, uh, until she was available. And then this booming voice came over an intercom saying, the dame will see you now. <laughs> Just like that. And I thought, this is very bad. 
I'm like, how, how did I get into these situations? And so I, I stepped into her office and my colleague, Irene Higginson, who's a, a leading palliative care researcher, many contributions to the literature, snapped this photograph. And you'll notice um, that we're both looking relatively happy and I'm not particularly uncomfortable. And it's primarily because uh, Dame Cicely Saunders really had nothing she wanted to ask me whatsoever. I'm not even sure she knew exactly who I was. <laughs> But the, so the only question she asked, and this was at about 10 o'clock in the morning, was, would you care for a sherry? This was her liquor cabinet, and these were empty sherry glasses. And, and so this look is uh, one that reflects kind of a, a certain degree of intoxication. <laughs> but, but on a more serious note, I mean, Dame Saunders is very famous for this uh, adage that has become sort of the, the central philosophical tenet in palliative care. And it reads, you matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. And when you think about the challenges that we face uh, in, in healthcare writ large and in palliative care certainly specifically, this graphic really captures the essence of some of that problem. And, and, and Dr. King, I think, also spoke of this, this notion of being seen, being acknowledged. And um, we in healthcare, whether we are providers or whether we are learners, from the outside, we're engaged with the diagnosis, with the problem checklist, with the, the series of events that we need to follow in order to try and mitigate whatever medical aberration is happening and at the same time, what can be easily overlooked is the patient, the issue of personhood with the patient in the center of this, uh, of this really evocative graphic struggling to be seen. Um, over the course of, of my career, as was, was mentioned by Kerry, I've you know, had the opportunity to study what I think of as the, the experiential landscape of end of life, which means understanding you know, various dimensions of end-of-life care and what patients and families go through and encounter along the way. So everything from initially when I em emerged from psychiatric training and was thinking more in terms of you know, depression and anxiety and suicidality, desire for death, will to live, eventually what you learn is that there are dimensions of experience that really kind of uh, overflow the, that kind of psychiatric DSM box. And if you're really going to engage and understand what's going on with people, then you need to start looking at some of these things that are you know, seemingly more ephemeral, a bit more vague, and yet have such a profound influence on end-of-life experience. So we began studying dignity. And it, it wasn't just kind of happenstance that we began studying dignity. We, we started to look at it because we found that when you look at the Benelux countries and the experience of, for instance, Dutch physicians who have helped patients to actually end their lives by euthanasia or assisted suicide, an early study uh, that was published in The Lancet indicated that loss of dignity was the most highly cited reason as to why patients according to their physicians, sought out that particular end-of-life pathway. So we thought, well, this seems really important. This seems to be telling me that um, if dignity is worth dying for, then, then dignity is worth studying. And, and there wasn't anything in the empirical literature at, at that point in time. Uh, what there was in the literature was uh, dignity frequently being cited in a way that was highly politicized and in a way that would support whatever contentious issue you were arguing. So if we're talking about euthanasia, you'd say, this is a dignity issue. Autonomy, my decision, my body, you know, what could be simpler? And if you're on the opposite side of that political fence, you'd say, um, you know, Hippocratic oath, taking of life, kind of violation of palliative care principles, neither hasten nor postpone death, dignity issue. And we said, you know what, that's not our lane, that's not our expertise, that is the, the political issues or the philosophical issues, but as clinicians and as empiricists, what happens if we go to the bedside and just start talking to people who are actually facing you know, imminence of dying? What do they tell us about dignity? How can we understand it? And um, amongst the, the many, many things that we discovered along the way was what for me turned out to be this sort of extraordinary kind of epiphany or realization that 
If you want to understand patient dignity and what is predictive of whether or not dignity is intact, and this is based on you know, many study, uh, studies that have looked at many variables that might have an influence on dignity, it turned out that the way that patients perceive themselves to be seen, the experience that you have in terms of how your healthcare provider either sees you or does not see you, turned out to be most predictive of whether or not your dignity was intact. And for me, this was this kind of real epiphany uh, in that I mean, we always think about good care being what we do with the patient or good care being what we do with the family. And now this empirical finding was saying, well, actually, what matters even more so than any of that, um, certainly every bit as much as that, if not more, because of the, the way that the modeling came out in our, uh, in our data set, the way that people experience your outlook towards them seems to be the thing that is most predictive of whether or not they're going to feel this sense of affirmation, that we've recognized who they are as a person. And so besides the main findings, which were published in a journal, The Lancet, I wrote uh, an additional article that was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology called Dignity and the Eye of the Beholder. And after the fact, discovered this incredible etching by this Dutch graphic artist, M.C. Escher. And what I, I mean, what I label this as, Escher certainly didn't have this in mind, but what I label this as is um, a reflection of the, of, in the eye of the healthcare provider. And the reason that I kind of juxtapose these two is that if patients are looking for a reflection of themselves in the eye of the healthcare provider, in this self-portrait of Escher, what you see is a man who is in his apartment, surrounded by his belongings, his photographs, pictures, books. In other words, this is a picture of affirmation. As opposed to, you know, what can oftentimes happen, you know, in the busyness of healthcare, which is the patient experiences the reflection as essentially containing a differential diagnosis, a problem checklist, you know, a series of events that need to take place for me to enact the technical aspects of healthcare, but nothing that necessarily is reflective of who you are as a person. And so, you know, this important insight really then said, well, if that's the case, we need to be thinking about what happens, you know, between the ears of the healthcare provider. How do we see people? How do we experience them? And there needing to be a mindfulness about that. So we began, you know, very methodically to think about the healthcare provider gaze. You know, what shapes the healthcare provider gaze? How can we influence it in ways that are going to result in dignity in care being achieved? And so over the course of uh, just over three decades, some of you who attended my earlier talks know the inside joke. I said that, you know, after you've been at it for a certain period of time, I mean, when you're younger, you think, you know, 10 years experience, that would sound like an impressive, you know, attribute. You think, 20 years, that would sound impressive. But I was wondering if there's a certain tipping point, you know, like if you, you know, when it comes to the day where I say, I've been at this for 50 years, somebody might say, I think maybe it's time you started doing something else. <laughs> More years start to undermine credibility rather than adding on to them. So we began looking at, well, are there various approaches that we can investigate, explore, uh, try and disseminate that might be elevating of personhood in the clinical arena? One of them is, uh, as Carrie uh, mentioned in the introduction, it's a brief psychological intervention called dignity therapy. So dignity therapy, I mean, it's based on a model of dignity in the terminally ill, again, based on data that we generated in our studies, uh, that provided us guidance that said, here are the elements from the model that you need to invoke if you are going to have a psychological intervention that is going to be you know, respectful of, adherent to uh, this notion of elevating patient dignity. And in this, patients are guided through a conversation that essentially asks them about um, vignettes with respect to memories that they might want preserved. But in addition to the biographical, things that are even more emotionally evocative, like are there things that still need to be said or you would want to say for your family member to hear in your voice? Um, are there words of wisdom, things that you have learned along the way? 
hopes, wishes, dreams. What guidance can you provide for people uh, by virtue of sharing those hopes or dreams with loved ones? Uh, I was telling some folks uh, in some of my many, many sessions, I have been working very hard since I arrived in Stanford. Um, and in one of those 20 or 25 sessions, I said to someone that the most recent dignity therapy that I recall was with a, uh, a young woman who had uh, advanced disseminated breast cancer, early marriage, young child, only child in her family of origin, and how she used dignity therapy as a way of providing, creating a legacy, providing guidance to this unborn child, giving permission to her spouse to find a partner who could love their child in a way that she might have. And it was glorious. And that is, you know, the epitome of what the dignity therapy is about. And I put up this particular paper juxtaposed to the book that I wrote on dignity therapy, which now is being translated into multiple languages and is being um, delivered in various different healthcare settings and studied in different healthcare settings you know, worldwide. Um, this was a, a randomized control trial that we did of dignity therapy. We've done phase one trials, we've done phase three trials, and there are about a, a hundred papers now reporting on multiple uh, different clinical trials of dignity therapy, along with um, about, uh, last count, there were about 10 systematic reviews. And collectively, what the data shows is that dignity therapy enhances end-of-life experience depending on the population in which it's invoked and depending on the outcome measures that you use. So, for example, there's a, a wonderful Portuguese study that happened to enroll highly distressed patients and reported dignity therapy in randomized control conditions was able to mitigate depression, anxiety, demoralization, and I believe desire for death. Now, the other thing that's happened to dignity therapy over the years is it's, uh, it, so to speak, it's gained legs. And by that, what I mean is it was originally conceived as a way of trying to kind of enhance end-of-life experience for people who were imminently approaching death. Um, but when you think about dignity therapy and the essence of its intent, it really is about trying to allow people to address personhood when personhood you know, feels under assault or feels as though it's being fractured in some way. Well, um, dying doesn't have a monopoly on that feeling. Um, where else is personhood under assault? And over the years, I have seen and received correspondence about different studies that are taking place where personhood is particularly vulnerable. So this is a study by some uh, um, uh, Italian colleagues um, in which they were looking uh, at uh, dignity therapy in the context of prison populations. And uh, in fact, uh, this photograph is a photo of a cover of a dignity therapy document that was sent to me by a hospital chaplain who had done dignity therapy with uh, uh, an inmate that he had been seen who was incarcerated and would be living out his final days in prison. And it's just this extraordinary image of this person, you know, surrounded by bars in isolation to the end of his life. Um, where else is personhood under assault? Well, uh, again, if you think about patients who are struggling with mental illness, you know, the end organ, the target organ under assault is self. And so dignity therapy is being invoked in uh, mental health populations as a possible way of intervening to try and help people kind of reclaim this notion of personhood and to place it on our radar as well. And then finally, uh, another area where personhood is under assault is in the context of, of cognitive decline. And there have been some studies, this is uh, dear colleague uh, Bridget Johnson, who also spent some time in our research unit and then went back to Scotland and did this study, looking at trying to um, do dignity therapy in patients with uh, mild to moderate dementia, either alone or with a family member so that the dignity therapy legacy document can be sort of a, a co-construction. And in case I didn't explain kind of the, the specifics of dignity therapy, which are, are too detailed to go through uh, in its entirety in a short session, these conversations are guided by a therapist. Um, they are recorded, they're transcribed, they go through an editing protocol so that at the end of the day, the patient is left with a document that in essence is kind of this pristine narrative. And it is intended for them to give to um, their loved one, um, 
hopefully um, at a time when uh, they are well enough so that it can engage people in further conversation, which I think is really a, a, a hallmark of success in dignity therapy, when it can open up conversations in the here now, although there are some patients who are insistent that it is something that will be bequeathed and, and left after, uh, after they have died. Um, so those are the areas in which dignity therapy has kind of uh, made inroads. And that's one way that we've tried to kind of, you know, shape the lens of the healthcare provider, trying to put personhood on the radar. What are some other approaches? Well, we have developed what we call the patient dignity inventory. So it's an outcome measure. I mean, at this point, again, it's sort of being used as kind of a gold standard of measuring dignity-related distress. It's based on the model of dignity in the terminally ill. So again, it's not that we sat around and said, well, you know, what, what ought we to ask these folks? We had done studies that developed a model that said, these are the elements of dignity, if you were going to understand how to uphold it or what might undermine it. And then these are the items on an outcome measure that you would need to tap into if you're going to get a sense, well, what is it that could affect a patient's sense of dignity? And it's sort of multidimensional, meaning that we cover the physical, the psychological, the existential, the spiritual. So there are some items on here that are very much, you know, typical of, you know, a palliative care approach in looking at things like pain and anxiety and depression. Um, but one of the items, for instance, is feeling like I'm no longer who I was. Now, it's not a typical question that we would ask routinely. And at the same time, I mean, in our experience, feeling like I'm no longer me is a profound existential question for patients who are feeling and facing overwhelming medical calamity. You know, when the calamity starts to undermine your sense of kind of personal integrity, that I'm, I'm no longer the person I was. And, and in our studies, we have found that this is affiliated with loss of dignity in nearly 75 to 85% of instances. So the, the elegance of this is it gives you language and it gives you a way of trying to distill what is it that is causing your angst and being able to tap into the fact that, you know, maybe not feeling like the person that you once were is kind of the, uh, the origins of why you are feeling this uh, loss of dignity. And uh, just as an aside, I mean, some people say, well, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, I mean, you feel... You don't feel like you, or you feel like a burden. Okay, I, I hear you, but, but I don't have a way of being able to address that. And, and my retort is that the beginning of being therapeutically effective isn't necessarily claiming that you have a way to fix it, but being willing to listen, to be in the presence of, to acknowledge. And I'm going to be talking more about that when I get onto a, a more recent approach that I've been uh, talking about and introduced into the literature called intensive caring. So the nice thing about this a new instrument like this, is it's a bit like having a new microscope or telescope. You, you know, it helps you see things that otherwise wouldn't be visible. And so if you look through the patient dignity inventory, which, by the way, usually when administered by uh, clinicians, reveals material in about 90% of instances that the person, that the clinician didn't previously know, um, it gives you a way of seeing what we've called the landscape of distress in the terminally ill. And this is just a, a, a prevalent study that said, you know, um, first and foremost, we reported that, you know, not being able to continue usual routines was a source of distress for a group of terminally ill patients, all with less than six-month life expectancy. Uh, the vast majority had some uh, ad advanced malignancy and were in their late 60s, early 70s. Physically distressing symptoms, not being able to carry out important roles, followed by, you know, just under 40%, no longer feeling like who I was, that that would cause substantive distress for them. So a new instrument like this is helpful in putting personhood on the radar because it makes sure that you have these probes that allow the patient to respond to various sources of distress that you might not otherwise tap into. So let's circle back to, uh, to Dame Saunders for a moment, or Dame Sicily, I should say, for a, a moment. And as I said, you know, she was famous for, you know, having founded the, the, the modern uh, hospice movement and for this adage about, you know, you matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. So 
I began thinking about this, and as important as those words are, what they weren't accompanied by is a way of being able to invoke an approach for patients who feel that they don't matter. So when it comes to uh, people who are in dire physical distress, I mean, we have intensive care. But what if somebody is in dire psychological, spiritual, existential distress? Well, this paper proposes we need an approach that I've coined intensive caring. And intensive caring incorporates all of the empirical approaches that we've developed over the course of the last just over 30 years um, to say these are approaches that we can use to help us be in the presence of suffering where people feel that they don't matter. They're feeling hopeless, helpless. Um, that, you know, as one gentleman told me, that breathing, uh, as he said, has become redundant. So let me briefly uh, try and go through some of the elements of, of intensive caring. The first is, is this whole notion of, of non-abandonment. And if you think about the dynamics of abandonment, this is really uh, generated by a feeling of, of helplessness um, and therefore of withdrawal. You know, if, if I feel overwhelmed that I really have nothing to offer, uh, my choices are either staying present and feeling kind of useless or to retreat and say, that's just not my lane. And certainly for those of us who have been working in medicine for uh, a long time, I mean, you very quickly encounter that, I mean, as lovely as it is occasionally to be able to examine, to diagnose, to fix, that there are many things that lie well beyond that paradigm that are essentially not fixable. And if we're going to be medical healers, if you will, then we need to find a way of staying present. So that is kind of the underpinnings of abandonment, and in which case, if we are going to stay present, and we need to take an interest in, in who that person is, understand that personhood and uh, eliciting personhood matters. So this is uh, Stuart Farber, and Stuart was a palliative care physician um, uh, in uh, Washington State. And during the course of his uh, approaching death, he published some lovely reflective pieces on what that experience was like. Um, and this was published, I think, in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management. And what Stewart said was this, with rare exception, the clinicians who treated me have good hearts, care deeply, but possess little or no knowledge of my thread. My thread is the narrative I use to make sense of my life. It is longitudinal, nonlinear, emotional, filled with contradictions, and integrates my life experiences into a coherent whole. It is within the values and meanings of my story that treatment decisions are made. What contributes to meaning and quality is not about living longer, but living a life that is consistent with my thread. And then the final sentence, which really is kind of the, uh, the, 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 the real important point, I would say, is that without knowing my thread, it is impossible for a clinician to provide respectful care. And I've said to you know, many groups that I've met with over the last few days, I mean, oftentimes, you know, we, uh, we talk about the importance of person-centered care. And I would say, and have said, in the absence of knowing who this person is, you cannot do person-centered care. You know, you can do polite care, you can do nice care, you can do efficient, call it whatever you like, but it is not person-centered care in the absence of knowing, as Stuart says, my thread. So what is an approach that we can use uh, efficiently to try and as a matter of routine, in every instance, without exception, um, elicit personhood. And so we began playing with something that we called the patient dignity question, which is, what should I know about you as a person to help me take the best care of you that I can? Now, it seems kind of a wonky thing, perhaps, to, uh, to study or to investigate uh, in a kind of an empirical, objective way. How did we do it? Well, we uh, went to the bedside of, of the patient and essentially had a conversation that said, look, we, we know a lot about your medical circumstances. I mean, you know, that is the essence of everything documented in your chart. Um, and while that is of critical importance, what we know very little about is, so who are you? you know, what, and ask the question, what would you like us to know about you um, as a person so that we can take the best care of you that I can? And, I, in some ways, you know, thinking back to that metaphor of the lens, this is a way 
of offering the patient a way of trying to shape the lens, right? It's saying, okay, we're going to come here and see you. Uh, you get a chance to shape, you know, the glasses through which we'll pierce so that we can, you can influence what we might perceive. We have a conversation that lasts 5, 10, at most 15 minutes in which we're trying to elicit, I mean, what are the things that you would want us to know about you just so we kind of kind of get who you are? And, and by the way, we've done this with patients and family members. So if the patient can no longer respond to the PDQ, we'll ask the family member. And, and by the by, what we found is that the influence that that information has on the healthcare provider is identical. So whether it's the patient voice or the family voice, the influence on the healthcare provider by being uh, provided information about who that individual is is uh, identical. So we then uh, have the conversation, we go off, and then we summarize it, come back to the bedside to read it, say, is it accurate? Any editorial changes? And then the litmus test, can we place this on your chart? Which is, of course, you would expect, if this is how I want to be seen, you would expect that everyone would want it placed on in their chart. And indeed, in any PDQ study that I've been involved in, every person in every instance says, this is how I want to be seen, or this is how I want my family member to be seen. So we've then gone back and you know, asked patients, so you know, trying to kind of uh, quantify this, trying to kind of uh, uh, measure it up, what is the influence? And again, without being able to go into a lot of detail, essentially what people say is, in every instance, I want it on the chart. Um, they invariably say that it's accurate um, and that it's important information for their healthcare provider to know. And when we talk to healthcare providers, besides, you know, about 90% of instances saying, you know, I didn't know all of that stuff that they told me, it enhances empathy, respect, connectedness um, in a way that is... Uh, really quite profound given the brevity of this sort of intervention. So during COVID, um, there were particular problems with trying to enact dignity conserving care for reasons that you know, are imminently understandable. And so we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to try and do a, a PDQ study, a patient dignity question study in our intensive care units? And so the, the protocol is exactly as I described, except we now go to the intensivist and say, look, you know, we want to do this study. Can you speak to the family member to give permission for us to contact them by telephone at home? And we will, you know, take them through a protocol in which we elicit information about who is this person, you know, this loved one who's now fighting for their lives, uh, usually on a ventilator or unconscious, not necessarily because of, of COVID per se, but any cause that might have led them to be now isolated, you know, with public health restrictions in an intensive care unit. The response from family members has been extraordinary. I mean, I've done some of these on my own in addition to my research assistants, and uh, people are gobsmacked. I mean, they, you know, they're in, in tears. They, they can barely believe that you, you're actually calling to find out who they are. And yes, indeed, that, that's, that's, that's what we want to know. Who is this person? So this is um, one of, I think there were two paragraphs, two or three paragraphs in this PDQ summary. Terry was the daughter of a mother who's now in intensive care. And it reads, Terry wants the healthcare team to know that her mother is not any ordinary patient, but a very special woman. Quote, since my mother was admitted, I've been struggling to find a way to share my mother's story with the staff. But my heart is so happy that this PDQ will now allow me to do so. I hope the staff read my mother's story and appreciate the life that she lived. And again, in, in relatively small print, essentially, um, with from the 33 family members who did this, five is the highest possible rating. And you can see everybody said, this is accurate. It's important for my healthcare team to know. Uh, this summary, uh, I think, will affect the way my healthcare provider attends to me. It should be offered to every other patient and family in the circumstance. And as I said, from my experience of, of having done this, this was a highly meaningful uh, experience for them to have taken part in. And so again, at this point, you know, the, the patient dignity question has gotten international legs. And this is a, a, a graphic that I created that at the time there were, I think, 15 translations, and now there are probably about a half a dozen others that have come to me and eventually will update this to say this has applications, uh, you know, uh, universally, I would suggest. Now, um, 
when the government of Canada in 2015, uh, there was a Supreme Court decision, Carter versus Canada, that was the beginnings of introducing medical aid in dying. And I was asked by the federal government to be the chair of a committee that would do kind of an international um, scan of uh, activities uh, relative to uh, euthanasia, assisted suicide, uh, nationally, internationally. And one of the people on our committee was this woman uh, sitting in the front uh, named Catherine Frizee. And you can see, um, obviously, Catherine is a, a wheelchair user. She has spinal muscular atrophy. Um, what you don't see or know is that Catherine also has an Olympian brain. She is uh, magnificent. I mean, one of the most, I, I, it was just a tremendous privilege to work with this person who is kind and funny and creative. She's been a poet. She's been a professor of disability studies at Ryerson and a, an extraordinary individual. Um, Catherine, in some of her writings, has reflected on this notion of, well, what happens if I enter into the healthcare gaze and how will I be seen? And this is what she wrote. Having to wear diapers and drooling are highly stigmatized departures from what is expected of adult bodies. Those of us who deviate uh, from these norms experience social shame and stigma that erodes resilience and increases vulnerability. The more deeply these stigmatized accounts are embedded in our discourse and social policy, the more deeply virulent social prejudice takes hold within our culture. And then she closes by saying, what assurance can we offer that the physician who treats these patients uh, these adults at end of life will not stand at their bedside with horror or revulsion in his heart. In other words, not only how will I be seen, but more to the point, how will I likely not be seen? And how is that going to affect the care that follows or a lack of care? And so this got me thinking about and writing about, well, how do we gauge what people need? And you know, the usual gauge, you know, is kind of self-reflective. I mean, we use ourselves kind of as a reference point and say, well, you know, how would I want to be treated? So, so to speak, the, the golden rule, treating people as you would want to be treated yourself. And the limitations of that is that, I mean, as important uh, a, a moral adage as that is, um, it imposes uh, an external standard which could lead to therapeutic nihilism. You know, I, I don't know that I would want to be that disabled or that marginalized or that disenfranchised or whatever the issue is that might lead you to a stance of being less active than more active. Um, and it can also lead to advice that may actually help, help you, if you were in that situation, avoid a future that you would find personally uh, untenable and therefore lead to kind of a discordance of goals of care. So, I published a paper in the Journal of, uh, of Palliative Medicine that now introduced what I called the platinum rule, which is to say, well, we need to think about doing unto patients as they would want done unto themselves. And the paper um, talks about a particular case where a gentleman who has a difficult head and neck, malig head and neck malignancy is approached by uh, his physician who says, you know, at some point, I, I have a feeling things may turn ugly. And at some point, you know, when that happens, you may want to consider medical assistance in dying. And this, the, the story goes on to say, so how can we understand what goes on in the eye of the healthcare provider? Because that was completely discordant with what this patient had in mind. That was certainly something that he had not envisioned or, or wanted. And so it talks about, you know, challenging this notion of using ourself as this kind of infallible barometer. So the platinum rule. And the advantages of the platinum rule, of course, are that it always says you know, we need to consider the patient's lens, not just our own lens. It helps us recognize and confront our own personal biases. And of course, we all have biases. Um, important standard for substitute decision making. You know, as I've said in some of my other sessions, when you're at the bedside of somebody who uh, no longer has voice, the correct question as a care provider to the child, spouses, you know, not what would you want us to do, but if we could bring your husband, if we could bring your child into this conversation now the way they were a week ago, a month ago, what would they want? So it's invoking this platinum standard and therefore raising the bar on person-centered care. Um, I, I wrote a, a second article 
on the platinum rule in which I told the story of my, uh, my sister Ellen, who was born with cerebral palsy, died about 15 years ago. And this was a few years before she died. She was in an intensive care ward. The intensivist uh, was trying to sort out, you know, how do we intubate? Does she need intubation? And is intubation appropriate under these circumstances? And the circumstances being, you know, she's got this, you know, massive disabilities, kyphosis, scoliosis, kind of the shape of a pretzel. And do we intubate someone who has that shape? And so he asked me the question, and it was the only question he asked about personhood, was, does she read magazines? And I thought, well, what do you, what does he mean? And then I came to, I thought, oh, I, I get it. And this is a really important question, and I better answer it right. And so I, I stopped, and I thought, I said, well, yes, she reads magazines, but only when she's in between novels. So I know that we've only got a matter of a few minutes, and I just want to finish off my comments on this notion of intensive caring. So what are some of the other elements? Um, what we, something we call therapeutic presence, and this is based on some studies that we've done looking at the elements of effective communication. Um, and so your way of being in the presence of another person, you know, not based on what you are doing or what you are saying, but about you know, your presence, your aura. It has to do with empathy and being non-judgmental, uh, fully present, authentic, trustworthy. That is another element of intensive caring. Um, the next element of intensive caring is this whole notion of holding hope. It's very easy for clinicians, for patients, for families to kind of fall into this position of kind of being rather nihilistic. I mean, you know, so what is the point? Um, my mother died 14 months ago, and, and I'd like to say that her last year was an easy one, but, but it was not. On the other hand, the time together meant something. I mean, there were, uh, I can't tell you how many scores of games of cribbage. I can't tell you how many hundreds of cups of tea and, you know, a thousand conversations in that time. It meant something. The last conversation that my older daughter, her granddaughter, had with her, and I just heard, heard the last threads of it as I walked out of the room, was... My, grand, my daughter sitting down with my mother and telling her how much happiness she had brought over the course of a lifetime. It meant something. You know, it serves a purpose, and certainly a purpose that my daughter will carry with her you know, into the future. And the last element of, therapeutic humi of uh, intensive caring is this whole notion of therapeutic humility. It's, it's recognizing that there are things that defy this paradigm of diagnose, examine, diagnose, and fix. And so therapeutic humility sees notions of fixing yield to commitment to understand the nature of the patient's suffering while creating a safe space to bear witness, to validate, to comfort always. And I think this is the second last slide, Carrie, in case you're keeping track of the time. The traditional medical paradigm uh, looks like this. We examine, we diagnose, we fix. Um, it's an incredibly powerful paradigm and, and, and a seductive one, and the reason why most of us, you know, usually enter into medicine. But intensive caring recognizes a shift in paradigm, and it says, you know, examination really needs to yield to, so who is this person? Um, diagnosis really needs to yield to, so how do I understand their suffering? And the notion of fixing really needs to yield to providing comfort always, being with, being in the presence of. And so my article, just as my talk closes, uh, with this final line, which is to say, it's been more than 50 years since Dame Sicily shared the wisdom informing this clinical approach. Decades later, when medicine's reach to fix exceeds its grasp, the time to consider the role of intensive caring is now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. I was talking fast, though, wasn't I? You I were, really, but I, I love I it. I got it all. I thought I wanted to cover, and I knew Carrie was my timekeeper. Yes. So your question about how would the patient want to be treated assumes that the patient has had some time to think about it and really in, personal insight and had that opportunity to self-reflect. Um, are there ways to help someone who just hasn't had a chance to pause and really think about what do I want? How do we get them in that frame of mind to consider 
um, their values in the first place if they haven't been thinking about it? Mm. What a great question. Um, I think, first of all, I mean, showing openness and creating space for, for that conversation to happen is helpful. Um, also, I, I think understanding that I mean, oftentimes we kind of reduce these things to uh, you know, what we consider uh, an event. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a point in time at which a decision has to be made, as opposed to it being kind of a process that really needs to be more organic and needs to, to unfold. So understanding that, although we may kind of open the door and broach that topic and begin to educate, it's something that, you know, is going to kind of take place over time in a way so that that person can come to grips with, you know, what it is that they indeed would want. The other thing I, I would just say that, you know, kind of backing up from that slightly is that there, I mean, I've never met a patient for whom personhood, you know, doesn't matter. Um, you know, for in every instance, I mean, people want to be known. Uh, people want to be, have that facet of who they are acknowledged. And when you enter into those kind of conversations, as brief as they are, the revelations are things that you really can't unsee. I mean, when I showed you that example of the, uh, the woman in intensive care. Um, I mean, the, the rest of the document, by the way, and there were another couple of paragraphs. She was a, uh, a First Nations woman whose daughter had gone missing, likely murdered, and she had spent you know, a great deal of her time trying to find out what happened, and in the course of that also became this kind of community leader and spiritual guide. You can't unsee that. I mean, and what a profound effect that has on anyone, everyone, who's looking after that individual. Um, I also, I, I was telling some people, uh, I, at one point I was interviewing a, uh, a physician who um, had uh, encountered leukemia, was treated in the hospital in which he was, at, you know, at one time, you know, the chief of medicine. And so his response, you know, what do I want people to know? I used to be the chief of medicine. And he went on to say, at, and he said to me that he wanted a sign, a hang a sign on his bedpost that read PIP, P-I-P, Previously important person. <laughs> so the point is, you know, um, these conversations matter. And they don't just matter to, to some patients. I, I think they matter to everyone. The other thing is that even though these insights, you know, are brought to you from the perspective of end of life, end of life is just a place, a position that has allowed me to study things that reflect on the entirety of kind of the human experience. And so I, I would suggest that it doesn't matter whether we're talking from cradle to grave. I mean, any time that you have a healthcare encounter, the times that people feel that care is being abrasive is when this aspect of care is somehow being overlooked. You know, nobody wants to be reduced to, you know, their ailment, the, the body part that is misbehaving. That's when people suffer. And if you're particularly ill, you know, your vulnerability, your fragility around that is more intense, and so suffering is commensurate. Thank you. Yes. I'm not a doctor, I'm a patient. And the fundamental interaction that I have with doctors is based on time. They don't have time. What you're talking about essentially implies time. And what I see more and more today that there's none, and I have two questions about that. Can you get it somehow, or is there a way you can delegate this and have, say, an assistant person looking at this and helping? I... Great question. So, so the question is, okay, this all sounds really compelling. Um, how are we supposed to do it? Where, where do we find the time to do it? Um, and, and can it be delegated? I mean, you know, maybe, maybe we need to have somebody else who uh, is hired to be nice to people. And we have a, a set of others who are just sort of engaged in the, uh, the, the technical aspects of care. Um, a, a couple of things. I mean, I would say, you know, in terms of delegation, I think these are, these are core efficiencies that any health care provider can have. I mean, I wrote an article called The ABCDs of Dignity Conserving Care. And what it says is just like in, inter in internal medicine, we have the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. You know, if you were choking to death right now, and I ran up to you, held your hand, looked in your eyes as you 
captured your, you know, caught your last breath and say, does this remind you of some trauma you had in early childhood? <laughs> well, everybody would say, I mean, he's a bozo. And I said, well, no, I'm a psychiatrist. You know, this is not my lane, you know, but I gave him, you know, professional empathy. Say, that's ridiculous. So what I say is that, you know, on the humanities of healthcare, no one should be absolved from knowing that, you know, their, their demeanor, their disposition, the way they treat people is going to have a profound influence. One of the, the articles that maybe has the goofiest title but really captures the essence of my career was titled, The Secret is Out, Patients are People with Feelings That Matter. Okay? So again, so I would say, no, I don't think you can delegate this. I, now, the other thing, though, is, well, what about time? You say, well, if you have a minute, you have that minute to make a good impression or a bad impression. It's the same minute. If you are fully present as opposed to kind of present, distracted, it has a very different impact on that patient. There have been studies that have looked at, you know, the randomized trials that have looked at whether or not the physician stands versus sits without changing anything else that happens in anything else that's said. What happens? When the physician sits, the perception of the patient is that the time spent was five times greater than it actually was. Compared to when the physician stands, they have a perception of not nearly the same amount of time. So I would say this can't be delegated. If you're going to be in medicine, you're dealing with human beings. You're, it's not the automobile industry where we're dealing with steel and platinum. We're flesh and blood. Uh, people's feelings can be hurt. And if you aren't attentive to this, this is the reason why patients complain. This is the reason why patients largely litigate, because they feel that they have been treated in an assaultive way. And as one of my uh, colleagues used to say, he said, patients will forgive you almost anything, uh, but they will not forgive you lack of kindness. It's a great talk, and it's all about dying. But what about the first day you go into your GP meeting the GP for the first time? Shouldn't that, um, what should I know about you question be asked the very first day? And yes. I, is, that, is there any research on that? Yes, so, so I mean, getting back to your remarks, you know, it, it's all about dying. The research, I mean, my research has been, you know, I mean, I've been working in palliative care. So all of the studies that I've done, indeed, come from palliative care. But the findings, as I pointed out, I think resonate across the entirety of, of the human experience. And so, um, I mean, it's not the case that personhood becomes important when you're on the brink of no longer being alive, or that respect uh, becomes important when you're nearing death. They're, they're always important. I mean, what happens is that, you know, as you get sicker, you become more vulnerable. And as you become more vulnerable, even slights uh, can cause suffering that, uh, of course, you know, can be you know, so terrible for patients, especially when they feel that it violates you know, the essence of who they are. But to your point, absolutely. I mean, you come to your GP, you want them to know just, not just in terms of you know, your, your, your body parts, your bits, bits and bobs, as I've called them in some of my writing, but which is generic, right? We all have the same bits and bobs. They, they basically have the same function. And the problem with being seen in that kind of generic way is we feel that you're not seeing me. Well, patient is a generic term. That's why you know, people sort of you know, talk about you know, the cancer patient, the cardiac patient, the kidney patient. What does that mean? It means that we're, we're seeing people through the lens of their ailment. Like one clinician who I dealt with who uh, had been working in nephrology for a long time, I mean, she f was becoming so jaded uh, in her work that she said, you know, I don't like to admit this, but, you know, you get to a point where patients are kidneys on legs. That's not good for patients. That's not good for her. And she, and she was aware of that. So you're right. I can't think of a, a single encounter where personhood oughtn't to be something that we are, are mindful of and begin to elicit in some way. And it doesn't have to take a lot of time. It can be, I, I told the anecdote, of, I was passing by the doorway of a, a very busy hematologist oncologist who, as the door was shutting and the patient was in there, the last thing that he said is, so how was the vacation? I can guarantee you that within 15 seconds, he was, they, they weren't sitting there looking through photographs. But in acknowledging that, I mean, what he's saying is that, you know, um, leukemia doesn't take a vacation. People do. 
So you acknowledge it. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Chachana. We're really grateful for this visit. Thank you. I have a few announcements before we conclude the evening. Um, Dr. Chachanoff will also be giving medicine grand rounds tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., which is both in person and um, also can be viewed live stream via Zoom. Dr. Sheila Lahajani, who's our director of psychosocial oncology, will be hosting that session. So everyone is welcome. Um, we also invite you to next year's Jonathan King lectureship. The topic will be on artificial intelligence and the humanities within medicine. Dr. Yakuma Crystal from Vanderbilt. Um, it will be the presenter next year, and we're really looking forward. That will be Tuesday, October 8th at 5.30 Pacific time. So mark your calendars, and we'd love to see you here. Um, for everyone here in person tonight, we will be having a reception outdoor on the patio until 7.30. So everyone is welcome to that gathering for us to spend some more time with our um, guest here, Dr. Chachna. And to all the viewers who are live streaming from across the globe, thank you so much for joining this evening. And we really look forward to seeing you again next year. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.